Death March. Looking up at the box one evening as I read emails from work, I decided it was time to do something about the box once and for all. I'm leaving one thing out. I wasn't reading emails at the time. I had shut the computer off and gone to the books I had lining my office walls. They weren't special books. Everything sentimental was long gone. These had been purchased by an interior decorator. In my real working days, I sometimes met people at my house, and I didn't have time to buy enough to fill those shelves, much less arrange them all. I had found something I recognized, though, the collected works of Edgar Allan Poe, and I found the raven in its pages. The decorator was very thoughtful, I noticed. Next to that volume was one of those old-fashioned candlesticks with the tray and the little round handle the kind Scrooge would walk around with, along with an old-looking box of matches. I lit it and read the poem out loud into the darkness, my voice echoing across the hardwood floors. It made me feel different. It broke the mind-numbing boredom of my existence, and it seemed fitting. If everyone else thought I was crazy, I might as well act like it. So, when I looked up at the box, it was lit only by moonlight, other than the candle, and in my apocalyptic mood, I raised a finger at it and said, You must be banished. The book sat resolute on the shelf. It had survived the meth fire long before, and my gut told me that my childish ideas like putting it in a crusher would not be enough to annihilate something so diabolical. If I were an evil magic box, I said, I wouldn't disappear just because someone crushed me. Would you? I half expected it to give a little snap, but its silence corroborated my thoughts. I would have to sequester it, bury it deep in the ground, or put it into a concrete foundation, or at the bottom of a lake. Or the sea, I thought. The sea. And where would the deepest part of the sea be? The Mariana Trench, of course. It had barely ever been visited. Anything put down there would be there for centuries, thousands of years. Better yet, the second deepest place in the ocean. Less people to snoop around. I would disguise it as a boulder and dump it down there. I went back to my desk to find the second deepest place in the world. It was the Tonga Trench, and even better, it was way, way out in the Pacific. I poured myself a whiskey. I also left out that I was having a few drinks, if you couldn't tell already, and took out my phone. I knew just how I would get there. Phil, I said. Cam, he said. It's been a while. Haven't seen you at the club. Yeah, I've been there. We just haven't met up. Hey, Phil, I have a question for you. Phil was a friend from the country club. He was a little wary of me. I didn't have a lucky past, and while I could afford to stay at the club, I wouldn't have been able to afford getting in anymore. More to the point, I wouldn't have had the status. I was kind of a patrician that went back down to pleb and wouldn't go away. But he was also a longtime friend and not the kind who throws people to the curb, and he had something I needed a personal deep-sea submarine. He wasn't as determined as Richard Branson, who did go to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, but he went pretty far the heck down there. I'll pay for the whole expedition, Phil. It's not just that. The Death March doesn't go down that far. The Death March? You called your sub the Death March? Yeah, the wife told me the Death Star was too geeky. I shook my head, though he couldn't see me. He continued, It only goes down nine kilometers. That's it? Do you know how ridiculously deep that is? About seven miles. 5.6. That's all? It's a very expensive sub, Kim. Why can't you just throw this thing overboard with some weights attached? You know why. That could end up anywhere. I want to make sure it goes right where I want it. It can't go 10.8 clicks down. We'll attach a line to it and lower it the rest of the way. That's ridiculous. It's too long. I ran to my computer. 
How about the Kermadec Trench? That's only 9.9. .9. We can go down 9 clicks and lower it the rest of the way. You can't put more than 500 meters of line on that thing. Actually, I don't know about that. I've never put a line on it. And this is a one-man sub. It's very dangerous. You can train me. Why don't you get your own? Because I want it now. I'll put money in escrow. The full amount. Phil sighed. He dodged and weaved for a few more minutes, but I convinced him. I leaned back in my chair and stared up at the box. Its corner was turned toward me like a shoulder in my face. I poured another whiskey. The Descent Training for that expedition was the most fun I'd had in a long time. That sub was awesome, and going below the level where light can reach was as exhilarating as it was terrifying. It was freezing down there, and the sub made funny noises. I always felt like it was going to implode, which would be instant death. And the fish you saw down there were amazing. You would wait and wait and suddenly see a lure fish for just a second, and it would disappear. And I saw a couple of blobfish down there, which, by the way, look fine and respectable creatures, and they haven't been hauled out to the surface to die. We rigged up a coil with 500 meters of metal line and attached the box to it inside a hollowed out rock and we put a camera on it. I would descend to nine clicks, drop the line, and then release the rock. Hopefully it would go the extra 400 meters into the trench. And heck, if it wasn't exactly right, so much the better. Even less chance someone would find it. The descent took hours. I had comms with the surface through an underwater acoustic system, so I could message through type, but nothing else, since radio doesn't work that deep. I had no direct link to the surface at all. That would be too much cable to haul back up. I was like an earthly astronaut down there. I tried calling myself an aquanaut, but the purists frowned on it, because the capsule was not as pressurized as the ambient water. If it were, the mission would take weeks to allow me to pressurize and decompress, if it were even possible. What kept me alive was an inner sphere struggling to keep out the weight of the massive pressure of the ocean. At nine clicks, I lowered the cable, it spooled out all the way, and in the camera, I could see nothing, just endless blackness. So I got ready to release the rock wind the line back, and start drifting back up. Except right then, I saw a long, huge shape sail past the camera. Most fish down there are small, even the ones that look big because of their teeth. But this was probably 50 feet long. I thought it might be a giant squid. I messaged the surface, and they said it sounded like a giant squid, and asked if there was video. I told him there was and was about to release the rock when the thing came back. It seemed to examine the rock with its huge eye. I told the crew, and they said I'd better release the whole line mechanism and come back up. If it latched onto me for some reason, that would be trouble. What worried me was that it would grab the rock. And who knew where it might turn up? It might eat it, die, float to the surface, and get fished out and then someone would find the box. That may sound far-fetched, but it's exactly the kind of thing that would happen with an evil magic box. There was some Greek king where that happened with his ring. So I decided to descend a little lower. 10, 20, 30 meters. The crew knew this and started messaging in all caps. I wasn't worried. You stop at nine clicks, not because it's the maximum distance it can go down, because it, but because it's the maximum safe distance it can go down. The only question was exactly how much farther it could go, which was a matter of probability. I took my chances. I went down to an extra 100 meters. The all caps kept coming in, so I put a notebook over the screen. I didn't hear so much as a ping from the hull. The death march was fine. The squid kept coming and going and was obviously interested in the rock, which was starting to swing back and forth. I was 200 meters down. 
300 meters. Everything was fine. Just 100 more and the rock would be sitting on the seafloor. I slowed the descent. 310, 320, 330. I heard a little ping from the hull. 340, 350. Another ping. 360. And suddenly, the sea floor came into view. That was good luck. I was obviously off the bottom of the trench a little, but that was fine. It was 40 meters less to go, and as, as said, being off would hide it that much better. The bottom was only another 5 meters down. All I had to do was flip the switch. The squid came along and bumped it. The camera gave a reeling picture of the thing's body and the blackness behind it. Better go a little farther down, I thought. One meter, two meters, three meters. I stopped. Then I flipped the switch and blam, that was it. When a sub implodes at that depth, it happens in milliseconds. You have no time to react. You don't hear anything, you don't feel anything, you don't see anything. You are just gone. And that's what I was. Nothing. Tiny particles at best. Not even fish food. Your idea of hell. But I wasn't dead. Not really. I woke up again. I know I was down there because it was beyond cold. It was pitch black, and I felt every pascal of pressure on my body. I stayed like that, unsure which way was up, for hours. The pain was intense. Finally, I heard a voice, very faintly, then suddenly, right in my ear. It was Pete. You aren't going to like this, he said. And that's when the torture started. A light blinded me. And I was in a strange cave, wet and dank, but at the same time boiling hot. I was tied to a rock, and Pete stood there holding a red-hot poker in my stomach, which he pushed into my liver. And then Catherine came into view with long claws on her hands, and she scratched at me. And then there was Steve and McCormick and all of them. And worst of all, a blood-red figure that stood and cackled over me. That went on for years. Hundreds of years. And finally, the blood-red cackler commanded me to write this. He said, It'll go in the box, so you better write good. Real good. He kept saying that. Good. Real good. And so I wrote all of what is above. I don't know how I did it. I just thought it, and it went onto the paper. I don't know how it got into the box, or even if it did. But if it did, I'm telling you again, don't use the box. You must have opened it, I think. I don't know how this works. If you have already, don't do anything with it. Just bury it. Keep it safe from others and make sure it gets hidden again before you die. Just don't use it. Because it's hell down here, and this is where you'll end up. And you won't understand what's going on. And that may be the worst part. I can understand all the people I killed, but not Catherine. I was sorry about her. And why Pete? He keeps screaming that it's my fault. He says if I hadn't been so damn curious, none of this ever would have happened. But how was I supposed to know? I never wanted to hurt him. And it was Catherine who did it. But I think the blood-red man tortures everyone who gets killed by the box, not just the ones who use it. I think every second is like a week down here. I think Pete was crazy long before I ever got here. But I don't know. At least Gabrielle isn't here, or Cam Jr., or Pete and little Gabrielle, or my little Catherine. They escaped. But I don't even want to think that, because if the blood-red cackler heard my thoughts, he would bring her here to torture me, too. I just wish I could be obliterated, smashed to nothing, put in the black void forever. 
and have no mind or thoughts. So don't use a box. I'm saying it for your own good. Leave it alone. The Cave of the Gods Tierra del Fuego has thousands of tiny little islands and caves. It is a desolate place, mostly, and thus perfect for exploration by young boys. At the bottom of a familiar cliff, two of them climbed over slippery rocks toward an opening they had seen before but never visited. It was difficult to time it right. They needed a very low tide, and they needed to be at the entrance just before it reached its lowest level. Then they would be able to explore for about 20 minutes before it flooded again. It had taken them numerous attempts to get the timing right, and when they got it wrong, they had to wait another two to four weeks for another really low tide. On top of that, school or some other obligation had gotten in the way a few times, not to mention weather. But that day, they were going to make it. They were sure of it. Joaquin was first. They spoke Spanish, but he said, Arturo, can you see? Goes in a long way. Arturo was right behind him. Sort of. They made their way to the entrance. Their watches told them they were exactly on time. The cave sloped upwards, and while it was slippery, it was easy to walk. They had strong flashlights, which they shined around inside. It's huge, said Joaquin. There was a cathedral-like quality to the way the rocks on either side ordered a space they could walk, and they could see that farther in there were stalactites and stalagmites, indicating that part of it was above the surf at high tide. Potentially, they could stay in there through a high tide. Thoughts of a secret hideout filled their minds. But they had just a short time to explore. They went up almost to where the surf line was and looked around. It's like Valhalla, said Joaquin. Look, said Arturo, there's something up there. They went closer, and above their reach, a wooden box rested on a kind of natural shelf. Lift me up, said Joaquin. Arturo locked his fingers and squatted down so Joaquin could stand on them and hoist up to get the box. Okay, let go, he said, holding himself up with the elbows on the ledge as he held the box. Arturo released Joaquin's foot and grabbed his waist to help him down. They looked at the box. There's no opening, said Arturo. We better go, said Joaquin. They made their way back to the entrance and back up to solid ground as the waves came higher. Can it make us rich? They brought it to Joaquin's house. There was a shed out back. They fiddled around with the box, looking for a way to open it. What should we do with it? I don't know. But how did it get there? It's brand new. Maybe it's magic. Maybe. Maybe it's one of those boxes that duplicates anything you put in it. What should we put in? Do you have any money? Boxes like that don't work with money, only things. Joaquin sat with the box on his lap. Hold on, he said. He shut his eyes for a few moments, breathed deeply, and then put his hands on the side and got it open just by instinct. How'd you do that, said Arturo. My papa taught me. You have to stay calm to do anything. There's a book inside, said Arturo. That's weird. It's all handwritten. What does it say? Hmm. Por favor, tu no usar el... Wait. No usar para boxear? Don't box with it? That doesn't make any sense. It's long, said Joaquin. Probably someone di someone's diary, said Arturo. We'll look at that later, Joaquin said, stuffing the box into his jacket. What can we put in here, then? Let's put a nail in and see if it works. No, don't waste it. What if it only works once? I know, said Arturo. My mom's jewelry box has a lot of stuff. There's a gold necklace in there. That will be perfect. Why not all the jewelry? She'd notice. Okay, then, let's go. The boys hid the box on a high shelf and went to Arturo's house. Arturo's mother started making them hot chocolate. You must be freezing, she said. You're all wet. I hope you haven't been down by the cliff again. No, Mama, said Arturo. I have to go use the bathroom. 
Arturo disappeared for a couple of minutes, then sat down as his mother was pouring the hot water. I didn't hear you flush, she said. Arturo looked at Joaquin. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Be right back. He went down the hall toward the bathroom. He turned and pointed to his pocket. Joaquin nodded. Then Arturo went into the bathroom, flushed the toilet, and came back to the table. They gulped the hot chocolate down as fast as they could bear and left. Thanks, Mama, said Arturo. Thanks, Mrs. Ramos, said Joaquin. You're not even dry, she said. But it was too late. She took her head she shook her head as they ran away. Gold. They went to the shed and took the box down. Okay, here goes, said Arturo, putting the necklace in. The box snapped down, almost pinching his fingers. The boy looked at each other. The boys looked at each other. Joaquin tried to open the box, but it would not yield. He shook it, and the necklace rattled inside. Let me try, said Arturo, but he couldn't open it either. What now, said Joaquin? I don't know. They kept trying for another half hour. Look, said Joaquin, I'll keep it under my bed. Come back tomorrow and we'll look again. Why do you get to keep it? I found it. I'm the one who saw it. Yeah, but I got it off the shelf. I held you up, and it's my mom's necklace. I'm older. Fine, said Arturo, but don't lose it. He went home, and Joaquin sneaked it up into his room. He checked on it again and again, but he could never open it. All that happened was he heard the necklace jangling around. Where's Arturo? The next day, the first thing Joaquin did was pick up the box. There was no sound. He sat at his desk and tried and tried to open it, but nothing happened. Then he remembered the day before. He shut his eyes, reached out by instinct, and it opened in its slow, dignified way. It was empty. He didn't know what he would tell Arturo. Arturo might think he stole the necklace. He shut the box again in hopes it would reappear, but then he couldn't get it open again, and he heard nothing inside. He sat around in dread all day and into the afternoon, expecting Arturo to appear at the door any second. As the sun started to go down, he went downstairs to his mother. Something wrong, she said? Arturo was supposed to come over, and he never came. Why don't you call him? I tried a while ago. No one picked up. Maybe you should go over and check. Okay, he said reluctantly. He knew he would have to, but he also knew he needed to have his mother tell him to. The screen door slammed behind him as he left. In the dark, he wondered how he would explain the necklace. Arturo would be upset. They would both get in trouble. In the distance, he saw the lights of Arturo's house. There were several cars there, and he saw the silhouettes of a few people outside. He slowed his pace, then stopped. They weren't regular cars. There were two police cars and an ambulance.